In this lecture, we will continue our discussion on magnetic ceramics material. In an earlier lecture, we have already discussed the basics of magnetism, the origin of magnetism particularly in atoms due to the orbital movement of the electrons and also the spin movement of the electrons. So, we had seen there are two basic origins or basic nature of the magnetic moment in, a, in, a metal, in an atom, one is orbital and another is spin and we have also seen the phenomenological magnetic behavior of different materials and based on that we have grouped the different materials or the whole gamut of materials in uh, four or five different uh, groups diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, ferrimagnetic, antiferromagnetic. So, these are basically five different groups and we have also seen how they respond uh, to the external magnetic field. Some of their very weakly response, uh, response quite weakly, the other very strongly and their origin of uh, this response are also little different. So, we have seen uh, up to the ferromagnetic behavior, ferrimagnetic behavior is also there. Now, ferromagnetism basically arises from uh, the unfilled D cells and one can find out what kind of behavior ex is expected from what different kind of elements having unfilled D cells. So, that is one of our first discussion in this lecture and therefore, we first look at the so called electronic structures which we have learned in the school chemistry. Uh, what is the distribution of the different electrons uh, in uh, uh, the different elements particularly the transformation elements having unfilled D cells. To start with the scandium which is uh, the atomic number is 21 and this is how uh, they are distributed and one can see the first one has to see in the last two columns. Uh, these are all 4 s 2 and one can see the D 1 keeping uh, D, D can have uh, over total number of 10 electrons. Uh, so, before D is filled up, the A's has been filled up and that is why it is called the unfilled D cells or D electrons, uh, D uh, elements. So, in all these cases, particularly this group, we can see 4 uh, A's is already filled up, whereas D is slowly getting filled up from scandium to nickel. So, scandium has 21 electrons and this is 22, 23, 24, iron has 26, cobalt 27 and nickel 28. Uh, one can remember that iron, cobalt, nickel are one of the strongest ferromagnetic materials. Whereas, uh, copper and zinc uh, once again is a filled D cell, but unfilled uh, S cell. Yeah. So, this is the distribution of the electron between D and S cell. So, that is one of the major uh, source or that is one of the causes of uh, strong uh, magnetism in some of these ions. Now, with this background, we would also like to look at some other principle. Uh, this is what called the calculation of saturation magnetization in ferromagnetic elements uh, and that is uh, Hund's rule. Ferromagn some of these ions do give rise to ferromagnetism and uh, we have seen the D cell is slowly filled up from one electron here uh, to uh, nickel uh, which is about uh, 8 electrons. Uh, but what is the spin? Because we have also mentioned earlier that in all these cells, unfilled D cells, it is the 
spin magnetic moments which dominates the contribution of the orbital magnetic moment is almost negligible. So, we are not so much concerned about the orbital magnetic moment in, this, in these cases. Our main concern is how the spin magnetic moment is behaving and how much it is contribution to the overall magnetism. So, here you have only one magnetic uh, one uh, electron in the D cell, then in titanium there are two electrons and uh, vanadium 23 has uh, three electrons, chromium have four, manganese has five and then iron has six and so on. So, one thing you have to notice that is what we call the Huns rule how the spin is getting arranged. There are two different spins half, half plus up and minus up. So, the first electron will have plus up and the second must have the minus up that is the normal expectation. However, in this case that is really not so and that is given or uh, that is the uh, rule of Hund's. Uh, first of all, all the electrons still all they fell because you have five subcells, each subcell has uh, can accommodate two electrons of two different spins. So, if the second electron comes or is, is present there in titanium for example, uh, the spin will be as same as that of the first. Okay. So, it is not this electron will fill up the first subcell first and then go to, then the additional electrons will go to the next subcell. It is not so. Uh, so, till all the 5 subcells, 10 electrons have been subdivided or grouped under uh, 2 each. So, you have 5 uh, subcells and then all the 5 subcells must be filled up with electrons of the same spin. So, these are this is if this is positive, these 2 also will have positive, the third electron will also have positive spin and uh, fourth electron and so on the, uh, till the fifth electron is added, fifth electron is in the manganese. So, manganese have 5 d 5 and all the 5 will be filled up first the, the same spin and sixth electron will fill up with a uh, reverse spin. So, in iron for example, the sixth electron d 6 this will have the same spin okay. uh, sorry the different spin as in the first one and so on. So, the seventh one will have in the uh, second cell and third one will be in the third cell. So, this will have one kind of orbital moment uh, sorry the spin magnetic moment this will also have same, same spin magnetic moment in the same direction. So, up to the fifth up to d 5 the magnetic moment will increase and each magnetic moment if you remember our discussion earlier each electron will give rise to one Bohr magneton. Okay. This is gives you one more magneton, this is another more two Bohr magneton, magneton and three Bohr magneton four and five and so on. However, when we add sixth one, then this will have a positive spin and this will have a negative spin and they will cancel each other. So, the resultant will be 4, 4 Bohr magnet. So, up to this the number of Bohr magnet number of electrons will increase with the same spin and therefore, the magnet, magnetic moment will also increase and after that this will decrease, this will decrease. So, D 6 will have only 4 resultant Bohr magneton, D 7 will have 3 and D 8 will have only 2 right. There is no D 9 it will be after that after nickel actually it becomes D 10 both copper and manganese we as you have seen earlier both copper and manganese actually D 10. So, there is no D 9 here okay, because uh, up to this uh, this is uh, 4s2 and then once again it becomes 4s1 so d10 and 4s2 d10 okay. 
So, these are uh, basically supposed to be diamagnetic without any resultant magnetic moment. So, this is what we call the Hohn's law, how the additional electrons are getting filled up or providing happening uh, in which particular sub cell it is going and initially all the 5 till the um, 5 d, d electrons all the 5 will have the same spin then the reversal will take place okay, uh, one after the other. So, this is an important uh, concept and important uh, criteria one must remember. Now, uh, in addition to the element, this is uh, uh, scandium 21, titanium 22 electrons, we have vanadium 23. Now, there are few other ions are also mentioned and the number of electrons are actually 21. If you go back to the earlier table, chromium actually has 24 and uh, if you have chromium 3 plus that means 3 electrons have been donated uh, have been removed. So, it becomes uh, actually uh, 24 minus 3 it becomes 21 electrons and this 21 electrons sorry not this one previous one 23 electrons uh, chromium has also 21 electron 3 has been removed from here and these 3 are actually this 2 and this 1. So, it becomes d 3 it becomes d 3 that is what that is why it is mentioned here uh, it is 21 electrons, but it is a d 3. So, this is actually 3 d 3 uh, d electrons are there. Similarly, the case with manganese 4 minus 4 plus manganese is actually 25 here it is 25 you can see okay. uh, the element has a 25 electrons whereas 4 plus have 21 electrons and out in which you have 3 uh, 3d uh, 3d electrons okay. so it's a 3d structure and that's similarly here chromium the elemental chromium has 24 and it's a d4 configuration whereas mn3 plus Okay, Mn3 plus is also D4 configuration, although it has only 22 electrons. Uh, manganese, um, manganese basically 25 and 3 electrons are removed, so it becomes 22. Whereas, if it is manganese 2 plus, then it is 23, 22, 25 minus 2, 20, 23, and that is also have the same configuration of D5. Fe 3 plus is 23 electrons as such Fe is 26. So, if you remove 3 electrons becomes Fe 3 plus and it becomes a, again a D 5 T 5 configuration and that is how few more uh, ions have been mentioned Fe 2 plus also have the same Fe elemental Fe and Fe 2 Fe 2 plus have the same configuration of D 6 uh, that is clear from here this is uh, d 6. So, Fe 2 plus will these 2 electrons will, will be uh, will go away. Uh, so, it will be d 6. So, uh, whereas, copper 29 and uh, zinc 30 have completely field cells uh, whereas, nickel 28 has d 2 uh, sorry uh, it is uh, d 8 and this nickel 2 plus also same configuration. So, far as the d cell is concerned number of electrons will be different because s cell is uh, s electrons are actually getting removed, uh, but the d cell configuration remains unchanged. So, this is a very very important con consideration when you are discussing about the magnetic magnetic moment of d cell electrons uh, d cell atoms unfilled d cell atoms. Here is a list from the based on that here is a list 
of uh, magnetic moments of isolated 3D electron elements and or ions. Uh, depending on the number of electrons available in the D cell, these are some of the ions. Uh, scandium 3 plus is 3D, uh, 3 uh, is a D0 uh, configuration, so there is no magnetic moment. Uh, orbital magnetic moment as I, as I mentioned uh, is not playing any role in this, it is only the spin magnetic moment which is important. So, it is the number of electrons in the D cell which uh, is of, of our concern. Uh, D4, uh, vanadium 4 and titanium 3 is 3 D 1 and uh, calculated moment magnetic moment is 1.73 by the formula which you have shown earlier that uh, mu b into uh, s into s minus 1. If you do that, that gives you this kind of a 1.73 uh, is the calculated value and the resultant and the experimental value is very close to that. Okay. So, it is 1.80. Similarly, vanadium 3 plus is a 3D, 3D2 uh, uh, configuration 2.83 is the calculated and the theoretical is 2.8 it is very uh, good agreement. V2 plus and chromium 3 plus is a D3 configuration. So, it is 3.87 and 3.80 this is the theoretically calculated value and uh, the actual measurement is 3.8 manganese 3 plus and chromium 2 plus is D 4, D 4 configuration and 4.90 Bohr magnet. Remember these are 4.90 Bohr magnet mu b multiplied the actual value is multiplied by the value of mu b. So, 4.9 multiplied by mu b. Similarly, it is exactly same 4.9 multiplied by mu b. Mn2 plus and Fe3 plus uh, 3D5, this is configuration, this is 5.92 and 5.9. Iron 3 plus, iron 2 plus, okay. iron 2 plus is uh, 3D6, 4.9. Now, 4.9 and 5.0, there is a slight difference here, okay. it is not exactly same. So, the reason uh, of course, is uh, uh, different not from here, but uh, is not too different. Okay. Cobalt 2 plus 3.87, 4.8 again once again beyond this the difference or uh, the matching is not that well, but above this the matching is quite well. Okay. So, it depends on the total number of electrons here beyond 3 D 5 the matching is not that good. For example, 2.83 and 3.2, copper 2 plus 3 D 9 and copper plus as well as zinc 2 plus uh, is 3 D 10, so 0 0. This is certainly quite uh, expected and that is what we get in the measurement, uh, experimental measurement also. So, this is not a uh, not a ferromagnetic material, neither this is a ferromagnetic material. But some of these transmetal oxides do contribute to the ferromagnetic oxide, of course, not when because most of them are ions and so uh, their contribution comes in when uh, in the form of oxides and that we will see in the form of ferrimagnetic materials. Well, uh, to continue our discussion on ferromagnetic materials, uh, we have seen that these three elements iron, cobalt and nickel are the strong ferromagnetic materials. Okay. Whereas, the other element in the transition metal series although they have a uh, unfilled D cell um, and they are uh, they have they are individual magnetic moments of the each of the atoms, but the overall magnetic moment in the form of a solid 
in the crystal it is not that uh, strong. And uh, that comes from the consideration of what we call the exchange energy term. It is uh, the exchange energy to explain magnetic ordering of this is called the bethes slater interaction. So, it is the interaction between the atoms within a particular crystal structure depending on the d cell uh, diameter of the d cell that means the number of the d, uh, d, uh, d cell electrons and their arrangement and also the interatomic spacing, interatomic spacing uh, between the two atoms. So, these are the two different parameters uh, which has a very important role in, uh, uh, in actually providing the magnetic behavior uh, to explain the magnetic behavior of some of these elements not the oxides, oxide we will consider later. Uh, so, it is exchange energy term which is W w without going to the details of that. This is an important uh, uh, important plot uh, from this uh, Bethes letter interaction and that very well explains why some of the unfilled d cell, uh, d, uh, d cell electron uh, or d cell uh, elements have a strong magnetic interaction or very strong magnetic uh, moment whereas, the others do not. So, once we plotted once we plot this exchange interaction energy or exchange energy uh, against this ratio the ratio is a a by r 3 d a a is nothing but the ratio of the interatomic distance a a is the interatomic distance of that particular crystal structure in that particular crystal structure and then um, the radius of the 3 d cell obviously, the radius of the 3 d cell depends on the number of electrons available in the cell and uh, um, their interaction with each other. So, uh, if you plot that you will find these three elements uh, alpha iron, cobalt and nickel they have a very positive interaction energy or positive exchange energy. So, uh, w w when it is positive there is a strong ferromagnetic ordering. We will see what is exactly a ferromagnetic ordering, but uh, individual atoms individual atoms may have magnetic moments, but when they are combined in the form of a crystal structure or crystal uh, uh, the ordering uh, may vary that means, some of them are more disordered than the others and more ordered means more resultant magnetic moment. So, that is what we get when uh, exchange energy is positive there is a ferromagnetic ordering that means, all the atoms with a particular spin and with a particular resultant magnetic moment uh, gets order uh, gets aligned in a particular direction and in a parallel way and therefore, you have a strong coupling there is strong uh, magnetic uh, effect. If it is negative for example, manganese and chromium uh, although they have unfilled cells d electrons, but even then because of the exchange interaction is negative there is an anti ferromagnetic ordering is prevailing. Okay. So, if it is less than 0 there is a anti ferromagnetic ordering and which neutralizes each other and therefore, the overall magnetic moment is uh, uh, almost nil. Here is some if it is very close to 0 w w equal to 0 small and this kind of material is basically uh, paramagnetic. So, if it is fairly lower than 0 like this they have a anti parallel, anti -parallel uh, ordering if it is close to 0 then it is param paramagnetism there is a random random ordering and then if it is more positive then you have a ferromagnetic ordering or parallel uh, ordering parallel, al parallel alignment. This is anti parallel alignment this is random and then this is uh, 
parallel alignment. We will see this little more clearly uh, later on. So, uh, ferromagnetism means a very strong uh, magnetization and uh, uh, they respond to the external magnetic field very intensely and they have a permanent some kind of a spontaneous polarization, spontaneous magnetic polarization. However, this spontaneous magnetic polarization what we call the saturation magnetization here. Uh, is very strongly temperature dependent according to the Curie-Weiss law, the Curie law. Okay. And this relationship, this is the temperature dependence, basically the temperature dependence of ferromagnetism, uh, because uh, all magnetism, all magnetic behavior has some temperature dependence, because uh, higher is the temperature, higher is the thermal energy or thermal vibration, more is the disorder. So, even at a lower temperature, if you have a strong parallel orientation or anti parallel orientation uh, or uh, less uh, magnetic moment. So, all of them have some temperature dependence. We have seen earlier that the paramagnetic in case of paramagnetic there is a inverse law uh, which determines the temperature dependence. Here it is also a kind of inverse law, but with a slight difference earlier in case of paramagnetic property or paramagnetic materials uh, the chi m the susceptibility is was c by t that was the relationship. Here it is more or less same, but with slight difference there is a critical temperature T c. So, the critical temperature is the temperature where it becomes nil the magnetic saturation or magnetic uh, magnetization curve ultimately drops off. So, uh, at t equal to t 0 chi m becomes uh, very high okay, almost infinity, mm. but otherwise if you plot the magnetization that is the saturation magnet maximum magnetization available from the material as a function of temperature we will see at room temperature uh, close to room temperature it does not uh, vary so much more or less remains constant and then as the critical temperature is reached there is a this is the critical temperature the T c as the critical temperature is the polarization or the magnetization drops off uh, quite suddenly uh, quite sharply. So, for nickel these are the three important ferromagnetic materials uh, one can see there is a critical temperature in each case. Uh, this temperature is slightly higher than uh, 1000 K, this is about 1400 K and this is around uh, 650, 650 K. Okay. So, nickel uh, has a low Curie temperature, this T c is called the critical temperature or sometimes also referred to as Curie temperature. So, each ferromagnetic material has a characteristic uh, temperature beyond which beyond which the ferromagnetic ferromagnetism is lost. So, beyond that because of the thermal vibration the there is no magnetic ordering and the atoms uh, get disordered so far as the magnetic lines of magnetic uh, moment is concerned. So, uh, uh, cobalt has the highest uh, Curie temperature about 1400 K uh, then iron as around uh, 1050 and this is about 650 okay, 650 K. Uh, so, at lower temperature it is more or less constant and that is the reason it is called saturation magnetic saturation magnetic magnetization. This is a uh, polarization versus uh, by temperature. Okay. So, this is uh, the relationship of ferromagnetism uh, against temperature. This is what I was talking about the magnetic ordering. Uh, we have seen there is a magnetic moment originating from either from the orbital magnetic moment, orbital uh, uh, phenomena or uh, the spin phenomena. 
but for our purpose orbital phenomena is not that much of importance, spin phenomena is more important and that is the major contributor to the magnetic moment, overall magnetic moment or macroscopic magnetic moment of uh, the material. But uh, well, those spin magnetic moment are actually not the magnet, uh, macroscopic, but it is more of an atomistic. Uh, each atom is contributing uh, to the overall magnetic moment from its spin uh, situation. Now, in case of uh, ferromagnetic, this is a what we call a ferromagnetic ordering. This is anti ferromagnetic ordering and this is anti ferromagnetic ordering. Uh, in ferromagnetic ordering each of the atoms or each of the uh, magnetic moment is aligned in such a way they are in parallel orientation. Okay. We will look into this what exactly it means, but there is a parallel all the uh, uh, magnetic moment are parallelly oriented that means they are pointing out in the same pointing to the same direction and therefore an additive effect there is an additive effect so all of them actually combine combine to give you the macroscopic property so therefore that is the reason why it becomes more strong it strongly it has a strong magnetic moment the overall magnetic moment resultant magnetic moment is very strong or very high and that's the reason the chi is also more than 1 and permeability is also very high. Permeability is certainly because of high because of this reason. If you have a antiferromagnetic ordering, the last one in this case, you will see it is the same thing, but each one has an opposite spin or each one has an opposite magnetic moment in their aligned in the opposite direction and therefore, there is a cancellation. The overall magnetic moment of the assembly becomes uh, very close to 0 and therefore, it more or less so far as the permeability is concerned is more or less like a paramagnetic material. So, it is although individually individual element individual atoms has a strong magnetic um, moment, but the overall resultant magnetic moment is almost 0 very close to 0 and that is why this antiferromagnetic um, property or antiferromagnetic materials are grouped with along with the paramagnetic materials. They also have the same thing, but for a different region they are because of the random more random nature or less uh, magnetic moment for individual atoms. Whereas, there is a ferrimagnetic ordering there is another ordering which is mostly present in oxides mostly present in oxides uh, not in elements this is also incidentally this is also in oxides primarily occurs in insulators and oxide insulators. This occurs primarily in metals and there is a requires free electrons in the conduction band. Okay. So, that is another requirement which gives rise to the strong parallel alignment. Now, in the ferrimagnetism is also anti parallel very close to anti ferromagnetism but the in the two directions they are unequal the magnitudes are unequal although their alignments are anti parallel like anti ferromagnetism but the magnitudes are different and therefore there is a resultant uh, magnetic moment so the downward directions are smaller whereas the upward alignments are upward uh, oriented magnetic moments are larger and therefore, the, there is a positive uh, uh, po positive resultant positive magnetic moment in a particular direction. So, uh, like this uh, like ferromagnetism they are also strongly coupled they can be strongly coupled with the external magnetic field, but unlike this uh, anti ferromagnetism where they can be only weakly coupled. So, these are uh, the three different kind of orderings available in different materials. Uh, this requires as I just mentioned requires free electrons in the conduction band. So, mostly available in metals 
they are primarily insulators and these two groups are primarily oxides. So, when we talk about magnetic ceramics, uh, we are talking about basically these two groups of material, okay, either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. So, for the temperature dependence is concerned, both these ferromagnetic because uh, they are strongly coupled and they have some kind of a critical temperature, some kind of a critical temperature which is the Curie temperature and uh, this is available both ferromagnetic we have seen the example of ferromagnetism or ferromagnetic materials how this uh, temperature dependent the saturation magnetization becomes nil uh, at a above a temperature because of the thermal vibration they become no longer becomes parallel orientation parallel alignment they becomes randomly oriented and therefore we lose the magnetic property whereas here in case of anti magnetic ordering which is they have a, a, a critical temperature they are also criti as a critical temperature which is called nil temperature okay, T n and that happens below the critical temperature D n. So, uh, again beyond that temperature this alignment is no longer there. So, you get a random orientation and uh, you may end up with a paramagnetic material. So, both of them bo all the materials uh, change over to a paramagnetic behavior beyond a certain temperature. This is a very important phenomena of uh, uh, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic and ferrimagnetic materials. So, the characteristic hysteresis curves if we plot we have seen earlier for the para paramagnetic and diamagnetic there is a linear uh, magnetic material that means if you plot the magnetic induction or the magnetic polarization against H you will end up with a linear relationship. Here particularly for these two groups of magnetic material uh, whether it is ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic they have identical properties. So, far as the external magnetic field is concerned. So, when you apply an external magnetic field let us start from here uh, it has a non-linear characteristics okay, it has a non-linear characteristics like this it goes to a saturation value a highest value is where it saturates the magnetic induction or the polarization gets saturated at a some value of external magnetic field. But then if you reduce if one reduces the magnetic field or reverses the magnetic field uh, it follows a different curve or different path. So, initially from 0 field it follows this red line and then takes goes to the blue line and it follows a different path altogether and even at 0 field when the in the reverse direction when the field is 0 you have a, a uh, value of the magnetic induction or polarization. So, the magnetic uh, the material is still uh, magnetized and you have a, a remnant magnetization, remnant flux density one can say remnant magnetization or remnant flux density um, uh, this is B r. So, uh, it does not come back to 0, it does not follow the original path and then you need a additional uh, negative bias or negative field in the in the opposite direction you have to apply a field in the opposite direction to bring that value to the 0 value. And this uh, value of the magnetic field which is ne needed to neutralize the remnant flux density is called coercive field. Uh, these are all the terminologies which has also been used for ferromagnetic ferro ferroelectric material. In fact, 
the ferroelectric have been uh, discovered much later than the ferromagnetic group of materials. So, ferromagnetism was known much earlier, um, but we have discussed in a reverse way. So, the, in our discussion ferromagnetism comes later than ferroelectricity and that is why I am referring uh, to the earlier discussion of ferroelectricity. So, the origin is same, the reasons of this kind of hysteresis loop or hysteresis uh, curve uh, are exactly same uh, and it follows uh, the similar pattern uh, and also terminologies are also very uh, similar in the case uh, you have remanent polarization there here that was electric polarization, here magnetic polarization coercive field in uh, dielectric material it was electric field here is a magnetic field. So, otherwise it is same and as you have meant as you have discussed in case of dielectric material it is basically uh, this kind of a hysteresis curve or um, the origin of the coercive field or the origin of the remanent field remanent flux density remanent polarization is primarily because they have a domain structure. Okay. Uh, we will see in a minute what is the domain structure. Uh, so, that domain structure changes from zero field to higher field okay. and this is to some extent a much sluggish in nature. This movement is much sluggish, this changeover is much sluggish than the rate of change of the electric, uh, magnetic field and therefore, the it has a memory effect. So, uh, it changes from a more or less random structure, a random domain, domain alignment to almost a fully aligned uh, domains and that has its own relaxation time. So, it takes time and therefore, immediately it does not come back, it does not come back to the randomness. So, the alignment prefer alignment is uh, exists even after the withdrawal of the magnetic field. So, that is the origin of the hysteresis loop or the hysteresis curve uh, particularly for ferroelectric and ferrima, sorry ferro ferromagnetic and ferrimagnetic materials. Uh, this is curves for soft and hard magnetic materials. Well, when you are talking about um, ferromagnetic materials, there are two types of ferromagnetism. One is uh, the soft magnetism, hard magnetism. That means, uh, in hard material, it is difficult to magnetize and also difficult to demagnetize. Okay. Whereas, in soft magnetic material, it is fairly easy. That means, you need much less. Uh, external field to fully magnetize it or saturate the magnetization and also we need much less uh, reverse magnetic, magnetic field to demagnetize it. So, uh, these are the two the correct depending on the basically uh, depending on the area of the hysteresis loop. Okay. There are two different loops or the area under the curve because the area under the curve measures the total amount of energy needed to magnetize or demagnetize it. Okay. So, uh, this is a much uh, fatter or a very uh, high energy hysteresis loop. Uh, so, is the width is much larger and also so the uh, the coercive field is large, okay. this distance is large from 0 and to magnetize it fully magnetize it that is also quite large. The remanent magnetization is also very large okay. and you need more magnetic field in the reverse direction to neutralize it. So, the total overall shape is a large hysteresis loop. So, if the, there is a large hysteresis loop, this is uh, uh, as I mentioned, it is difficult to magnetize and also difficult to demagnetize. That is why there is a possibility that it, it re remains, it retains its magnetization you, uh, after the 
external field is withdrawn. So, we, it can get converted to a permanent magnet. So, such type of material will be uh, used can be used as a permanent magnet, whereas these are soft magnetic materials they need not they cannot be used as a permanent magnet the magnet energy will be lost uh, with very very little of uh, demagnetization force and therefore, uh, they can be used as more of an electromagnet electromagnets where the magnetic field will vary with the application of the external magnet or the magnetic moment or magnetic polarization will magnetic induction will vary uh, almost in phase with the applied magnetic field. So, that has its own application particularly uh, in many of the um, electronic devices uh, including, including the um, memory uh, for computers, but these days of course, these kind of uh, memories are not used, but it can be used for miniature as transformer cores, spot cores and so on, we will come to that later. So, both these type of both these varieties of uh, magnetic materials have their own uh, usefulness and one can design different devices based on this particular characteristics of whether it has a large hysteresis loop or a small hysteresis loop. Well, this is an example uh, we are talking about the antiferromagnetic material and this is anti, uh, a, an example of antiferromagnetism. Uh, it was also mentioned that some of the oxides do have this property and this is an example of manganese oxide MnO which is having a sodium chloride structure and uh, these are these positions of the uh, manganese and oxygen ions. Uh, these are the cubic symmetry, hex, uh, close pack hex cubic symmetry. So, these large ions, large ions are the oxygen ions and the corner ions here uh, are the manganese ions, manganese 2 plus. So, these are the manganese 2 plus ions along the diagonal here. And, uh, on the edges or on the uh, center of the edges, uh, we, have, we have oxygen ions. Of course, it can be in our uh, it can be reversed also, reversed in the sense it can be drawn. Basically, it is the same distribution, but it the unit cell can be drawn either with the cation at the cube edges, uh, cube cent cube uh, corners or oxygen at the cube corners, both uh, the systems uh, are equivalent basically. So, uh, these are uh, the manganese ions and these are the oxygen ions. Uh, using the so called Huns rule, uh, we can find that each manganese ion has a positive uh, magnetic or strong magnetic moment, okay. each positive each manganese ion as a strong positive moment, uh, magnetic moment uh, and therefore, they are all have certain amount of magnetic moments of the ions. Now, um, some of them in between each in between the two cations we will always have some oxygen ions and the oxygen ion uh, is basically a diamagnetic or a, there is a antiferromagnetic kind of coupling within the oxygen ion that means this oxygen uh, this oxygen this is the uh, overlap of the 3 d orbitals of the 2 p orbitals of the oxygen ion. So, this is a little details of the electronic configuration uh, here it is the 2 p orbital this is the oxygen ion and this is the 2 p orbital one lobe on this side and the lobe on this side. These are the orbitals of the d cell of the manganese ion manganese 2 plus ions 
So, you have uh, uh, four orbitals and there is always the structure is such that there is an overlap between the 3 d orbitals of the m n 2 plus and 2 p orbitals of the m n of the oxygen 2 minus gives rise to anti parallel alignment. Well, we are not going to the details why exactly it happens, but this much information is uh, acceptable uh, I mean ok for our purpose that that uh, this overlapping this overlapping of the orbitals gives rise to the anti parallel alignment anti parallel alignment of the neighboring m n 2 plus ions. This is m n 2 plus ion 1 m n 2 plus ion here and another m n 2 plus here we have oxygen in between. So, because of this overlap this is directed in this particular direction towards front whereas, this towards back. Okay. So, the next one all these this particular set of m n ions m n 2 plus ions are all directed uh, I mean uh, alternate ones alternate ones are directed uh, to, to the different directions. Okay. So, these are actually uh, d 4 electrons and these are the um, there is a exchange of electrons here. Okay. So, this m n 2 plus and this m n 2 plus are directed in two different directions this is the basic reason and because of this you have a anti parallel orientation and it is called the anti ferromagnetic materials. Although the individual cations have a strong uh, magnetic moment. The same is the case with other rock salt structure oxides like FeO, cobalt oxide and so on, nickel oxide. The antiferromagnetic materials also have they are strongly magnetic material but uh, sorry the weakly magnetic material they are weakly magnetic material uh, and they behave some kind of a paramagnetic way uh, this is another picture another uh, picture giving rise to the uh, orientation as you can see if this if you look at this uh, layer of atoms each one of them neighboring ions have a different orientation these are of course oxygen ions these are again uh, manganese ions oriented in opposite directions and so on. And there is a temperature called nil temperature anti ferromagnetic ordering takes place uh, at a temperature below the te nil temperature here this is the nil temperature and uh, the ordering is lost due to thermal vibration at temperature greater than uh, T n. So, very similar to T c in case of uh, in ferromagnetic material the Curie temperature you have a nil temperature and then the ordering can be or the temperature dependence can be expressed in this manner uh, C by T minus theta. Theta of course, is this one sometimes it is also written as T plus T c where T c is the negative value and it is called the T n. Okay. So, the, this is the Curie Weiss law with negative Curie temperature it is called negative Curie temperature that is this one, okay. but if you take T n it becomes T plus T n. So, that is uh, the characteristics of the anti ferromagnetic oxides particularly the oxides with rock salt structure. Well, we complete uh, this discussion here because next discussion will be on a separate group of uh, group of materials that is called ferrimagnetic materials, which are actually the most important group of magnetic ceramic materials, and they have enormous application potentiality. And uh, just to give you an idea that uh, these uh, are ferrimagnetic ferrimagnetic uh, materials once again oxides 
and they have a particular crystal structure. In fact, we will see later on there are three uh, particular structures in which uh, these oxides crystallize and they are all very strong magnetic materials having very similar characteristics as that of ferromagnetic characteristics. Although uh, as I mentioned earlier their origin is different and their coupling between the atoms are quite different than that of uh, ferromagnetic materials. Ferromagnetic materials appear only on elements like transition metals, iron, cobalt, nickel and their alloys whereas uh, a large group of oxides uh, do have the ferrimagnetic ordering and they are also strongly magnetic materials with tremendous application potentiality. We will discuss further about these materials in, uh, in greater details in the next class. Thank you, thank you for your attention.